Hi, I'm Jacob Halbrun, Senior Editor at the National Interest. Right now I'm in sunny Santa Monica, speaking with Robert Farley, who is a professor at the Patterson School of Diplomacy and International Commerce in Kentucky. And our first topic today is going to be what everyone's talking about, the Russian invasion of Georgia, or if you take the Russian side, intervention to protect its endangered citizens. Right. Or the legitimate and proper response of Russia to Georgian, uh, Georgian provocations, I think, how they might term That's it. That's right. This conflict has obviously been brewing for many years. Like the Ukraine, Georgia has wanted to become a member of NATO, perhaps partly to forestall the very events that have occurred in the past few days which is the Russian incursion in, into what the Georgians regard as their province. Georgia and Russia have had a long, tangled history, which was ably recounted today in the New York Times Week in Review section by James Trout. Right. Do you, think, do you think they had that ready to go, or do you think he put that together in, uh, in the hours on Friday? Well, I think uh, they obviously, that Trout has already obviously spent time there and uh, was quite prepared. And I thought that one of the interesting points he made, which, which many people forget, is that Georgia actually was an independent republic run by Mensheviks. The Mensheviks were the fiercest foes of the Bolsheviks, mm -hmm. both before and after the 1917 revolution in mm -hmm. October or November, depending which Russian calendar you use. Right. And I found it quite intriguing that um, Traub noted that history, that really we're talking about a conflict that goes back hundreds of years. So are we just talking about ethnic hatreds like we had in the Balkans, or are we talking about Russian imperialism, or are we talking about what John, Senator John McCain seems to be indicating, a new kind of Sudetenland crisis, where the Russians are in danger of triggering a Cold War. What's your take, Robert? Um, well, first, I mean, I think that we run a risk in, in talking about Georgia and, and Russia as uh, being too independent from one another um, because, of course, the Georgian nobility and, the, and Russia conquered Georgia a long time ago. Um, Georgia has periodically been independent since it was conquered as part of a larger project, a larger Russian imperial project of conquering various parts of the Caucasus. But the Georgian nobility was built into the um, Russian uh, imperial system. Um, if I recall correctly, one of the dukes of um, Mingrelia, which is a state within Georgia, was the master of uh, Tsar Nicholas II's bedchamber um, and was uh, executed uh, around the same time as Nicholas II. So, so that was an uh, iffy position to be in. True enough, yeah. Um, but it goes to show that the Georgian elite has been part of the Russian elite um, for a very long well, time. Well, including right? Stalin and, and Joseph Stalin Beria. Being, right, right. Beria and Stalin being uh, extremely notable. Um, Didn't Beria of, come to Stalin's coming? attention precisely because he'd been uh, so relentless and ruthless in uh, exterminating perceived class enemies in Georgia? As I understand it, yeah. I mean, that, that's 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 what I'm led to believe. So, I mean, these are these are two political elites that have been tightly bound together, um, in spite of uh, sort of various political lines that have been drawn about drawn between them. Um, that I mean, they, they they were both part of both the Russian imperial and the um, Soviet imperial um, political elite. So, the ties that bind these countries are are still, I think, really really tight. Um, and as to I mean, and, and some people have talked about that in terms of, and I, I guess we'll get this, into this in a second, but people have been wondering um, just how deeply the Russians may have gotten into the Georgian decision cycle on this, that, um, that there may be a fair number of people in Georgia who still don't like uh, Saakashvili um, and who have sympathies for Russia uh, and who um, may have, you know, whether, whether tipped off or whether given some inkling to, um, the Russians are even affected the, the Georgian decision making. Now that's a fascinating um, point. Let me jump in right there, because uh -huh. our this leads to to a logical question, which is what we don't know right now is how far the Russians are going to go. They've already right. uh, been shelling the city of Gori, which is in Georgia, Georgia proper, mm -hmm. and obviously uh, Zalmay Khalilazad today, the American ambassador to the United Nations, 
challenge the Russians and said, are you trying to engage in regime change, which is, of course, what George Bush did in Iraq. Right. And in some ways, this is something we should discuss. I believe the Bush administration's invasion of Iraq helped set, helped set a precedent for what the Russians mm-hmm. are doing in Georgia today, and that it's uh, pretty hypocrit- – Bush looks hypocritical when he attacks the Russians for doing this. But my immediate question is – and, and this will get to another question about the idea of a Cold War. Are the Russians going to try and put in a puppet regime a la Czechoslovakia in 1968 mm-hmm. or what they did in Poland after, after immediately after World War II? Are, they gonna, are there going to be quislings in Georgia that are going to run the country and cater to Russian interests? I, I do not doubt that the Russians have some people they would like to put into um, power in, uh, in Tbilisi. Um, I don't doubt that there are Quislings who would have to be happy to do that job for them. Um, you know, are they going to be able to pull that off? Uh, and that I'm just, I'm just not convinced of at this well, point. Well, why not? I mean, um, right. the Russian military looks vastly superior to the Georgian one. Uh, right. No one in Western Europe or in the United States is going to come to the military assistance of the Georgians. Mm-hmm. That would be foolhardy. Obviously, the West is conceding this in many ways as a, as a Russian sphere of influence. Right. So why wouldn't the Russians go all the way? You think it's the danger of a guerrilla insurgency? I, I think that's part of the problem. I mean, the, thing, the thing is, <coughs> and, and they're attacking Gori right now, which is about 17 miles uh, south of the capital of South, south Ossetia. And it's an over, I mean, as I understand it, it's over relatively um, accessible terrain. Um, the road to Tbilisi is about another 50 miles, and it's over mountains. So um, even to the extent that the Russians can launch an advance uh, this far, um, it's, it's a different undertaking altogether to push on to Tbilisi. But let's say they do that. Let's say they take Tbilisi um, and they push the, Russian, or the, the Georgian government out of Tbilisi. What if, what if Saakashvili just refuses to give up? Um, I mean, what if he simply moves to another uh, Georgian town? Um, I mean, it seems to me that the Russians have a, a, an enormous task here. And if they really want to change the government, they have to occupy pretty much the entire country. It's not going to be just capturing Tbilisi, because I don't think that Saakashvili and his government are going to give up if that happens. I mean, I really don't know. I don't think anybody knows at this point, maybe not even the Russians. Um, but it seems like quite the undertaking to, to conquer and occupy Georgia long enough to establish whatever quizlings they have in power. Right. And the, But there are reasons that the... Russians are attacking Georgia, of course, beyond mm-hmm. the claim of uh, protecting Russian citizenry in these right. in Abkhazia and South of Sechia. Um, but what do you think of the argument? How concerned do you think the Russians are about preventing the Georgians from being a transfer point of oil and uh, energy to? To, to Europe and that they want to maintain their monopoly? Um, I mean, that's a really interesting question, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, it's interesting because they have attempted to bomb the pipeline. Um, as I understand it, they have been unsuccessful in their attempts to bomb the pipeline, which is actually also kind of interesting. It tells you that there are limits to Russian military power, that they don't seem to be capable of destroying this pipeline. Um, but they've also um, blockaded um, the Black Sea Fleet has blockaded the, the uh, main Georgian port for oil export. Now, whether these are short-term moves to really squeeze um, the Georgian government or whether this is more part of a long-term strategy to control um, control Georgian oil export, uh, I'm really not sure. I, you know, I think it's probably, I think you're probably right that it, there's, there's a little bit of the latter in there. Um, because, of course, the, the Russians have good relations with Azerbaijan, the Russians have good relations with Iran, um, and just sort of the checkerboard nature of the Caucasus, um, there's a sort of almost a tic-tac-toe uh, situation where um, if the Russians have a friendly regime in Georgia, uh, then they have a linkage all the way between um, Iran to um, Russia, and they can limit oil export going out either way. Yeah, which so my own take on all of this is mm-hmm. that Putin even though he is a product of the Soviet Union, is really more of a Russian nationalist than a a communist, and that uh, talk about a new Cold War is vastly exaggerated. What the Russians are doing, they really can't move westward 
So they're looking s south to uh, expand their power where there's a, where there's a vacuum. Would you agree with that? Right. I mean, I, you know, I think I think that they're happy. I, I think that, and we can get into this a little bit too about about sort of how this started and what mistakes were made, um, especially in Georgia. Uh, I think that they were delighted to have the opportunity to throw this little country against the wall um, as as violently as possible. Because not only because they you know they were interested in the energy resources and they were you know they were mildly interested I suppose um, in the the two uh, breakaway provinces, but they really wanted to indicate to everyone else that that you know Russia is capable of throwing a country like this against the wall. Um, you know, it's the Ledeen doctrine only with Russians, and the Russians are probably better at it because they don't care about democracy. So is Vladimir right. Putin Russia's leading neocon? <laughs> uh, every country has its neocons, right? Every country has its has its um, has its people who believe that the enemy only understands force, that hawkishness is the only approach to foreign policy, um, that if we display weakness in front of the Russians, Iranians, Georgians, Belarusians, whoever, then we're doomed. So yeah, I mean, I, I think I think that Putin probably thinks along those lines. Um, and he probably thinks that a victory here, you know, really crushing the Georgians, is going to have foreign policy payoffs in every deal that the Russians make from now on. And in many ways, that's probably a correct abroad. assessment, isn't it? Right. But yeah. that was the thinking in the United States behind attacking Iraq. In, mm -hmm. uh, in my view, Dick Cheney and the hawks around him thought that uh, the United States needed to demonstrate that it would re react disproportionately to an attack on its own soil and you had a wounded nationalism in the United States. So George Bush went even further than Putin is today, didn't he? Because Bush didn't attack you know, some uh, Central American Republic or something that was considered under the Monroe Doctrine part of the United States, American sphere of influence. Instead, he went all the way into the heart of Arabia and with no provocation knocked out someone deemed to be a dire threat to American national interests and engaged in a regime change, exactly what Putin seems to be attempting to prosecute in the Caucasus today, isn't it? Well, and Putin's choice of, choice of target is a little bit less random than Bush's, but I mean, I think that there are certainly some commonalities. Um, I think there are some important differences, too. One is, you know, sort of like I suggested earlier, that, you know, the, when the Americans pounded Iraq into dust, we had to stay, right, because we had to pretend that we were going to install democracy. And so there was the occupation. I don't think the Russians care. I don't, I don't think they care about installing democracy. Um, so they can just pound Georgia to dust and then leave and reap all the benefits of crushing a ne next door country. Um, and the second thing is, you know, I mean, we can, we, can, we can certainly think about how much Iraq provided Russia with a, um, with a precedent for this. But, and, you know, and it may be true in some sort of counter universe that without Iraq there is no um, Russian crushing of Georgia, you know, for the precedent reason and maybe for other reasons as well. But I think we should be a little bit skeptical of claims along those lines, right? They might be true. I'm not sure that the preponderance of evidence is on them, right? I mean, Russia, Russia has some bad behavior to it. I mean, it, you know, I won't say that bad behavior is part of the, part of the, the Russian way of approaching things, but, uh, you know, I think that it would be, it's hard to argue that the Russian bad behavior here is really dependent on um, American bad behavior in Iraq. But we know that Russian behavior has been uh, pretty miserable over the past uh, few years. I mean, the right. attempted uh, assassinations abroad, well, some of which were successful, and mm -hmm. uh, the rise of... Uh, Putin's Camarilla, the uh, the campaign against the so the so-called oligarchs inside Russia, uh, kicking out British petroleum. Even though, again, it's an exaggeration to say that this is a return of the Soviet Union. It's uh, it's clearly uh, bad stuff is happening over there. Right. And as you point out, it's it's done without this veneer of democratization that uh, Bush put over American foreign policy, but what I wonder is, has Bush really weakened the hand of the United States in mm -hmm. challenging Russia and, and by extension, China about human rights and, and other issues? I mean, the Russians themselves are saying this is a joke. If you look at uh, Alan Brinkley had a piece in the New York Times Book Review a week ago reviewing Jane Mayer's new book, 
on the Bush administration's rendition policy, which is in effect the kidnapping policy of, of uh, foreign nationals. Mm-hmm. Apparently, you know, we've had thousands of people running through in these uh, American um, prisons and, and right. been interrogated with uh, no real rights, and uh, many of them have been tortured. So it's just tough for me to see that the United States has much leverage in this situation. Right, and, and, and one, one point, I guess, is that um, perhaps international criticism of Russia would be, would be less muted if it hadn't been for um, the invasion of Iraq, right, that perhaps there would be more sympathy for the U.S. position um, if, if, if the United States hadn't done all of these terrible things. Um, but then again, you know, in the middle of the 1990s, when, when you know, the U.S. was at least a, a more benign presence on the world stage, the Russians went in and destroyed a city, right? I mean, they, 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 they destroyed Grozny. Right. Um, and so... It is you know, old-fashioned warfare, too, isn't it? Right. I mean, right. the United States has precision weaponry and went, did go to great lengths to avoid civilian casualties in Baghdad. What we're seeing is a 19th century war conducted with 21st te- century technology in the sense mm-hmm. that the, the lethality of the weapons, that they're used indiscriminately. And, uh, right. you know, the consequences, of course, to the civilians are horrendous. I mean, we're seeing we're seeing Russia fight with 1990 weapons, and, and Georgia try to fight with 1970. Yeah, weapons, yeah, I suppose that's fair. Um, is is what we're seeing, and they're fighting it in in, in classic 20th century um, fire and movement style, right? Classic right. Soviet Red Army form warfare. So who who does take the blame for this conflict? I mean, it's obvious uh, that the Russians are uh, going out of their way to wage as punitive a war as possible. But doesn't Georgia deserve some of the blame for going out of its way to antagonize and taunt the Russian bear? I, I absolutely, I absolutely think so. I think that the Georgians, um, that uh, President Shaka, or Saakashvili, made a terrible error here. Um, now, I, I think that, I certainly think that it's possible that the Russians set up a trap for the Georgians. Um, that they had the forces ready to move into Abkhazia, the forces ready to move into um, South Ossetia, um, and then they started some skirmishing uh, on the border between the South Ossetians and the, and the Georgians, and the Ge- Georgians took the bait. Um, the Georgians took the bait and tried to push um, you know, Russian and Re- Russian sympathetic forces out of the Republic. Um, but that's still part of the problem. The Georgians still took the bait when they never should have took the bait. Um, it was a, it was a terrible error on the part of the Georgians, and it's one that a responsible, really I think, responsible statesman should not have made, um, because it's going to be end up disastrous for Georgia. And in hindsight, it's going to it's it's just going to be shocking about how did they make such a colossal error here in in giving the Russians the opportunity to just hammer away at Georgia for as long as they want. So Robert, let's let's stop pussyfooting here then and cut to the nitty gritty. Uh, what about American national interests? The neocons have been bellowing for years that we need to go on the offensive against Russia, that it's a threat, and the neocons have also been pushing stridently for Georgian entry into NATO. Uh, The Bush administration, in my view, has behaved recklessly by trying to install a missile defense systems in former Russian satellite countries in Poland and in the Czech Republic. Um, McCain today is talking about throwing Russia out of the G8. How much blame how much blame do the neocons deserve for this for creating an enemy out of Russia and pushing it to the right? And is there the possibility that Russia, in a sense, is playing into the hands of American neocons by creating a new kind of Cold War that no one really wants except for some extremists? Right. I mean, I guess that's the theory of the world that the neocons always win when the world gets worse. Um, You know, I mean, there's a lot... I mean. for one, I think that the Polish are going to become uh, a little bit less recalcitrant about the missile defense um, because they've been they've been playing a pretty hard bargaining game against the United States, um, knowing that um, a President Obama is less likely to push hard for missile defense 
uh, and knowing, therefore, that they have the Bush administration um, right where they want them. And I wonder if this is going to make the polls a little bit more flexible on that. Because, you know, the Western Europeans react differently from, than the Eastern Europeans to Russian threats. Um, and I, I think that the Polish reaction may be to move closer to the United States um, on the missile defense issue. Uh, you know, I mean, I thought, you know, and I'm somebody who thought that letting in, and I still think that letting the Baltic republics into um, NATO was a good idea. Um, I think that it will prevent the Russians from doing this kind of thing to the Baltic republics. I think we should let Finland in if Finland wants to, wants to get in. And I'm really curious, actually, now, if Finland is going to, to push to get in. It's big, been a big debate in that country. You know, I thought that the idea that we should let Georgia in is insane. Um, you, know, you have to have a credible threat. You have to have a credible threat of deterrence. And if Russia decided to call NATO's bluff on Georgia, what were we going to do? I mean, literally in military terms, how could we have helped Georgia? Right. I also find it interesting that McCain's uh, foreign policy advisor, Randy Schooneman, was right. registered as a lobbyist up until about a year ago for Georgia. Right. And it's, right. it's interesting to me that the Georgians knew exactly how to play the game and who to go to. Right to push their cause in D.C. Right, right. Um, you know, I mean, one one problem is that we now have, you know, what Georgia and what Ukraine, and to a lesser extent Poland and some of the others, were trying to buy by sending troops to Iraq um, and sending weapons to Iraq and supporting the invasion was U.S. foreign policy support in situations exactly like this. And now we see an example where, you know, the, the Georgian troops who are in Iraq fighting on our side are now being flown back because the United States can't do anything about the Russian invasion of Georgia, right? Um, and so it's an example of, you know, they, they tried to buy U.S. support, tried to become a U.S. ally and a contributing U.S. ally, and now there's nothing, right? I mean, that's got to be a problem for U.S. foreign policy interests, right? You know, these countries that thought that they were getting in, into the good graces of the United States and that this was going to be consequential, and it's not, right? It didn't help Georgia out at all. Right? I don't know how many soldiers uh, Georgia's had that died in Iraq. Probably not a lot, but probably a few. And, and there seems to have been no point whatsoever um, in terms of Georgia's larger foreign policy goals. Yes. As dangerous as, um, as all of this is, I wonder... I mean, you, you really haven't answered my question about McCain, which I, I think is at the nub here. The... the um, Discrepancy between what seemed to be Obama's initially more cautious response that there needed to be mediation and McCain's immediate hard line. Who who would have the better approach here as, as president? I think this is going to be a huge issue. And Obama was immediately somewhat more conciliatory, whereas McCain uh, took a much tougher line. And in, in calling for expelling Russia from the G8, it seems to me that uh, McCain is pursuing a dangerous and even uh, crackpot line that mm -hmm. should discredit him as a serious presidential candidate, that he does not have the judgment that's required to deal with an emergency situation, that he's instead offering an extreme foreign policy line that would exacerbate the situation rather than cool it. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that, you know, I would say that part of McCain's strategy is just electorally based, that he thinks that running a tough on Russia campaign is going to play well in the voters, uh, with the voters, um, that he's appealing to traditional Republican strengths in terms of, you know, in terms of foreign policy toughness um, and sort of almost, um, almost subconscious um, linkages between that idea of toughness and the perfidy of the Russians, right? The idea that the Russians are evil, that they're always going to be evil, and so forth. Um, and so I would say that he's playing he's playing this as a campaign tactic, but I think he really believes it. Um, I mean, I, th I think that John McCain is a committed um, committed hawk. I think that he has the hawk in his DNA. But beyond um, so hawk, what you're really saying is that he's an right. ideologue. Right. No, exactly. I think I think that his first idea and his first option in every crisis is U.S. force, right? Is, and if not U.S. force exactly, then the, the forceful use of U.S. diplomacy and the threat of force. And so I think that's what we're seeing here. I think, I think that those are his central instincts in foreign policy and that whatever issue we're talking about, whether it be Iran, Iraq, 
um, Pakistan or wherever else, or now Russia, you're going to see a very hawkish lineup. Which is why McCain wouldn't be a continuation of Bush, but an e- even more extreme version of him. I, I, I tend to agree. I tend, and, you know, who forgets? I mean, sometimes we do, but most of the time we remember. The neoconservatives were initially behind McCain because they were suspicious of George W. Bush because of his father. If you keep saying you agree with me, our blogging headmasters are going to be wringing their hands. Yeah, you know, that's the problem. Uh, you know, I agreed too much with Heather the last time, and so I think I'm going to be banned forever from, from blogging heads. Oh, maybe, okay. maybe they'll forgive us. Right, right. Um, but what about Obama hasn't really taken much of a stand on this issue either, has he? Right. I mean, he came out. He came out conciliatory, which I thought was justified, given the. Um, I mean, the circumstances of the initial attacks on either side were. Um, they, they 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 called for conciliation, right? Because there was bad Georgian behavior combined with bad Russian behavior, um, and mediation is really the the way you want to go. I mean, I think that as as Russia has really pushed this beyond. Um, what is reasonable, and it certainly is not reasonable to be bombarding cities all over Georgia and to be cutting off Georgian oil supplies and so forth. Um, He's become a little bit less conciliatory um, and a little bit more uh, certain about calling Russia out. That said, he hasn't done anything crazy like, you know, threaten to toss, threaten to demand costs of Russia that we won't be willing to make Russia pay, right? You know, simply demanding that we, we try to make Russia pay um, that we try to make Russia pay a price, like I think the Washington Post uh, editorial page said yesterday or the day before, is silly without thinking about exactly how we can make them pay. Um, and I'm really not sure that there's a convincing argument about how we can make the Russians pay. And I think that Obama is pretty much on top of that. Right. And we, even with our 100 military advisors over there, we are not getting entangled in that conflict any more than we are, right. are by, by having right. people on the ground there. Right. But I wonder, if you look at the Europeans, it does, I, I suspect it will stiffen European resistance to placating Russia. In some ways, you could argue that um, German Chancellor Angela Merkel created this conflict by deferring the issue of Georgian membership in NATO. It would have been interesting if she had said that a few months ago that, yes, Germany would like Georgia to become a member of NATO, then maybe the Russians would have been uh, more cautious. On the other hand, the, the, my read also is that the, it, the, it could have had the opposite effect as well, that the, the right. Russians would become even more incensed by what they see as right. Western meddling in their sphere of influence. Right. I mean, the Russians may have decided that it was a bluff anyway, um, which I'm not convinced that letting Georgia into NATO wouldn't have been a bluff. Because, you know, even if we let Georgia in and Georgia invokes Article 5 after after Russia attacks, you know, I'm still not convinced we actually see NATO military action against Russia, um, which would be a crisis for the organization. And to some extent, it's also the West that it has rearmed Russia. I mean, it's high oil prices that have helped right. rebuild the Russian army, right? I mean, it's right. our, it's our dollars TVs, that yeah. have been turned into weaponry mm-hmm. in Russia. And we've helped revive uh, Russia, perhaps not as a superpower, but as a great power within its in its region. Right. I mean, all all of the weapons that Russia had had been selling just to India and China over the past ten years or fifteen years, and hadn't been giving to its own military, Russia is now arming itself with, which is why we have relatively new Russian tanks, relatively new Russian aircraft, um, not really new Russian ships, but at least Russian ships that float. Um, um, off Georgia right now because the oil money has really revitalized um, Russian military forces. And they've become more assertive in places other than Georgia, um, fly, you know, flying the TU-95s and so forth um, all, over the, all over the world. But, yeah, no oil wealth. Oil wealth has um, made Russia, made Russian military power much more formidable. So does Robert Kagan have it right when he says that both Russia and China were going back to a uh, traditional... 19th century style kind of power conflict where everyone tries to carve out their sphere of influence and the United States will be unable to avoid this. That in fact, the peaceful, beneficent world based on economic interchange that was envisioned by the Clinton administration is instead a complete chimera. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm always, I'm always uh, reluctant to say Robert Kagan is right. Um, and in this case, I don't think he's right because I think he may have, he may to an extent, he may have Russia right because of the resource boom, 
I don't think China can really pursue. Um, you know, China has exactly the same or a very similar issue with Taiwan, and there, you know, there might be a war over Taiwan. Right. I mean, that brings an interesting question. Does uh, the Western? I suppose the neocons will argue that the Western failure to respond assertively mm-hmm. to Russian imperial designs in the Caucasus will inevitably send a bad message for Iran if it wants to attack right. Israel or for China if it uh, which you know has has a long standing claim to Taiwan right and this is interdependence of commitments um, and it's also it's also a silly argument because um, you know, particularly in the Israeli case, Israel doesn't need the West to react to an Iranian attack on Israel. Israel can can do as much damage to Iran as it wants. It can do a lot more damage to Iran than Iran can do to Israel. So that one right there, I think, is silly off the bat. The, the certainly claims will be made that... But a, it does um, raise the issue of Western credibility, right? Right. Um, an old argument, but... Right, right. No, it's an old Cold War, straightforward, realist-style argument about credibility and resolve and reputation. Um, it's not one that I really buy um, because I, I, I don't think necessarily that the Chinese are going to be for, foremost in their mind relying on the idea that the United States dinner didn't intervene um, when the Russians invaded Georgia when they're making their decision about whether to attack Taiwan, right? I think they'll be much more concerned about whether they can actually defeat Taiwan um, and whether they could actually defeat U.S. intervention if Taiwan actually, or if the United States actually decided to intervene in the war. Because, you know, it, it, it has to be more than just, well, they're, not, they're now not certain that the United States will intervene because they have to take account of the possibility that the United States might intervene. And in this case, you know, the United States just can't intervene on behalf of Georgia. There's no plausible way that we can. Well, if you were uh, human rights, I imagine that the human rights groups are going to be expressing their indignation at the uh, timorousness of Mm -hmm. the Bush administration and the Western European countries in not protesting this invasion even more energetically. I mean, you do have a coincidence of interests between the neocons and human rights groups both of which argue that a budding, nascent democracy in the heart of the Caucasus sets a noble example for the region, and that it's a, you know, a fragile plant, flower that needs to be nourished, not to be uh, crushed and uh, tossed aside like a withered bouquet. <laughs> Are you reading this? No. I mean, are you coming up with this? On, this is that's, that's some excellent. Oh, thanks, there. That's- um, but that that would be the, uh, the the perception of those right. who uh, have been uh, visibly and energetically su- supporting uh, Georgian independence. I mean, they are obviously many people in the West. I, I don't think the the Russians are completely delusional when they think that uh, the pushing NATO forward and so forth. Uh, it, it is creating or trying to create a kind of cordon sanitaire around right. Russia. And right. my own take on uh, the Georgians is that as, uh, as tragic as the situation is, they should have just let this autonomous region go. It's not really worth a war. Right. I, I, you know, I, I think Don't say that. you agree with me. Anything but that. Okay, well, I don't agree with you, and I'll, I'll describe uh, my differences in extreme nuance, and the nuance may be lost upon many of our listeners. I don't think so. Um, <laughs> don't underestimate them. Um, you know, I mean, one problem is that, that Georgia doesn't have perfect human rights record either. Um, I mean, it's a post-Soviet state, and even the, the Saakashvili regime um, has had some... Right, and he's declared a state of emergency and tried to suspend presidential elections, as the Post pointed out. Right, right. So, so there, there are some issues straight away there. Um, and, you know, you know, I do believe that human rights organizations will, will complain about Russian behavior. I mean, I think they've justifiably complained about Russian behavior before. But I think that they also sort of know the score and don't want to um, too often find themselves on the same side as the neoconservatives. Um, and so I guess my hope is that there will be some practicality um, that emerges from their thinking.
in terms of how to react to, to the Russian uh, invasion of Georgia. And, and, you know, let's, I mean, I suppose we could stop and be hopeful for at least a second and hope that, you know, whatever the Russians do to the Georgian army, um, that they'll pull back and they'll pull back into the, um, into the autonomous regions that are probably soon going to be Russia. Um, but you do think at a minimum they are going to overthrow the Georgian government, would be my guess, that if the door, the door was opened... Or we it mm-hmm. appears to have been opened by the Georgians right. through through their recklessness. And right. aren't the Russians going to move as quickly as possible to uh, solidify any gains, and then before more international pressure comes? Now I know I saw today mm-hmm. that um, Bernard Kushner, uh, the French um, minister, will be traveling to the Caucasus mm-hmm. and. Nicholas Sarkozy will be heading to uh, Moscow within the next few days. So my guess is it is not going to be the United States that solves this crisis, but Europe. Um, the Russians are more interested in close relations with Europe than they are with the United States. From what I've been able to glean, they really want to become a member of, of Europe and create a Europe that uh, is sort of an independent power center against the United States. Now, obviously, the Russians may have uh, overreached here in Georgia. But as I said, I still think this could ultimately lead to much more intensive negotiations between the Europeans and the Russians, with the United States essentially being a bystander in this crisis. Right, it's essentially playing no meaningful role. Um, You know, on on your first question... Are, are the Russians really going to, dis- at a minimum, going to displace the regime? And I guess that I am not yet convinced. I, I, you know, I suppose, I don't know, maybe maybe 50-50 chance whether they just pummel the Georgian army for a little while and then leave with the, the Saakashvili regime still in power. So it's more humiliating to leave him in power as right. a, um, essentially a, a leader right. who's been humbled and humiliated. Right, and, and it's also less risky for the Russians. Um, I mean, people have been talking a lot, I think, about how how this has been a risky maneuver for the Georgians. But the Russians accepted some risk here, too. Um, when Putin and Medvedev, um, whichever one made the decision, and frankly, we all know who made the decision. Well, we saw um, Putin meeting with the generals, and I right, think it's... Right, exactly. He's got his um, own puppet right in Russia. Forget about <laughs> right, Georgia. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah, and I've been kind of joking that they're going to find out that he's actually heir to the Romanov dynasty and just make him czar. Um, but, uh, you know, after this, he's going to be incredibly popular again. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Right. But, it, but it was risky because, because if, if for some reason something had gone wrong, and there is still the opportunity for stuff to go wrong, um, the Georgians could put up an unexpectedly tough fight. Well, what about the Ukrainians saying that they're not going to let the uh, Russian fleet return to its ports in the Crimea? That could be a problem too. Although my guess is that the Ukrainians are going to be so worried about the Russians, what the Russians might do to them, that we'll end up with a compromise of some fashion after after the so ceasefire between Russia and So, do you think, do you think that this incursion, to to give it a mild name, will uh, in fact cow the Ukrainians and the Poles and show them that the Russians mean business, or will it stiffen them up? I think it will stiffen the poles. Um, like I suggested, I think that the poles are going to be much more flexible in terms of the missile defense negotiations. Right. Um, because the poles are already part of NATO, right? And the, the Ukrainians, I'm less certain of. The Ukrainians are now going to be right on the front line. And the new Ukrainians also have their own irredentist problems with the Russians um, because um, there are parts of Ukraine that are occupied by a high-majority Russian population that want to be part of Russia. But let's flip the question. Yeah. Has American foreign policy towards Russia, beginning with the Clinton administration, not the Bush administration, mm-hmm. been an unmitigated disaster? It was the Clinton administration under Richard Holbrook who pushed this idea of expanding NATO. And didn't right. we, in fact, trigger uh, the very nationalist backlash in Russia that we wanted to avoid with policies such as uh, pulling... Uh, Romania and Poland into NATO, all of these things, in my view, violated the spirit, if not the letter, of the two plus four negotiations that led to the reunification of Germany. We were never supposed to be 
stationing American troops in these in these areas, and we promised essentially that we would not engage in this kind of behavior, and we did. So when the Russians come to Washington D.C., they enunciate a list of grievances, beginning with NATO, and now most recently with the what I re- regard as a harebrained missile defense project. I agree. Um, I'm not supposed to use that. Term. I know I'm not supposed to say that. <laughs> Uh, this the missile defense program. Uh, why wouldn't would a different American foreign policy have created a more conciliatory Russian bear? Uh, I guess this is one where I am going to disagree with you. Um, and you know, I certainly think that there's a difference between the Russian policy or the, uh, the the Russian policy of Clinton and Bush. And I would also say that you're you're, you're right insofar as the results of the um, the overall Clinton approach and the overall Bush approach have led us to a disastrous situation. Um, you know, I, I think that there were some substantial benefits to uh, letting Romania, Bulgaria, the Baltic states, Poland, and so forth into um, into NATO. What were the benefits the, for the United States? It, well, the benefits for the United States in terms of you know sort of raw strategic. Um, you know, I guess we get to put a we get to put a missile defense in Poland, and that's not much of a benefit. Um, it locked in gains, and locking in gains isn't simply in the sense that we have a strategic advantage versus Russia, but rather it locked in gains in terms of the ability of the NATO institutions, followed by the European Union institutions, which are different but are tied together. It locked in gains for the kind of regime um, that the United States wants to see in Europe. And, and that that kind of regime, a democratic, pluralist, liberal regime um, that is more or less stable, is much more likely to survive now in Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, and the Baltics because of the existence of NATO. Um, and so that there was in U.S. national interest, and that right there um, is a substantial gain for the United States. But it was more actually long-term. Yes, I mean, you, you can argue that the expansion of American military power took place, but I think they were also looking at secure borders and creating uh, economically viable countries in in this region. And the winner, long term, is probably the European Union, not the United States. Sure, but I don't think that the European Union and the United States have um, competing goals here. Uh, You know, I think that what's good for Europe is good for us. And to the extent that that Poland is stable... Look at the the worth of the dollar right now. It's true that we're economically connected, Mm -hmm. but the European Union is a formidable economic competitor to the United States. Sure, sure, but we live in a modern capitalist international system, and the fact that the Europeans are... Prosperous, and that they have, uh, you know, very uh, a lovely currency with, you know, lots, lots of really pretty bills. That's worth a lot right now. Isn't necessarily um, something that's bad for the United States. I mean, I think right, it's, it's good for good New York for merchants who are only being kept afloat by European tourists who are coming with hard mm-hmm. currency, while we have essentially a uh, devalued one. Well, it's also good for me when I go to Europe that I don't have to have francs, marks, right. uh, and everything else when I when I go over there. I mean, you know, in the but modern is it I'm surprised that you don't believe that uh, this is actually a zero sum game. I uh, see. I, I have some mildly realist tendencies. I wouldn't say overall that I'm a realist. I also told you that I was a raving uh, lunatic lefty, um, and as such, I think that the EU is great. Um, and not necessarily uh, competition with the United States. So, but yeah, I mean, I think that what's good for Europe is also good for the United States. I think that the creation of stable, economically prosperous regimes in Eastern Europe, good for the so United States. So you're kind States. of a Dean Acheson Democrat. A Dean Acheson Democrat. I mean, I, uh, he may, yeah, I mean... Well, I mean, the whole Truman administration after World War II, this was the dream, right? Right, right. But you get off the bus when it comes to antagonizing Russia. I'm just trying I to figure it out, that's all. <laughs> uh, that a, a, a balance among all things, right, that you have to antagonize Russia a little bit, right. and you can go f- too far in antagonizing Russia. My, my, Estonia's okay, Georgia too much. Right. My, well, it's an interesting question. Um, it'll be interesting to see if the Estonians start retaliating against the Russians that are living in, in their country, if there's some sort of upsurge of anti-Russian fervor in the Baltic states. Right. There's been a lot of upsurge as well in the United States over a quite different topic, but a perennial one. Mm -hmm. Sex and the politician. What's your take on the John Edwards saga? Uh, 
Is this something well, we should be even discussing, or does it pale in comparison when you look at series issues? You like know George? what? I mean, I, I think that we are overlooking the possibility that the two are related. Um, I, you know, I asked this on my blog, and, and people didn't really respond, but is it possible that John Edwards is a Russian stooge who just released this now, right when Russia was planning to invade Georgia, in an effort to take that off the front pages of the U.S. news media? Well, it's certainly possible. I actually don't even know how much attention... Uh, the Ameri- I don't even, I mean, that's an interesting question because I don't know that McCain, as you posited mm-hmm. before, will even be able to garner that much attention with his mm-hmm. anti Russia policy, except among some mm-hmm. Eastern European constituencies, as you were saying. Right. But I guess the Edwards affair doesn't really play for either the Democrats or the Republicans, does it? Since both parties have experienced such painful episodes in the past year. Right. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of surprised. I, I mean, I, especially given the two other things that were going on in the world, the one being the, um, the war and the other being the Olympics. I was very surprised when I was watching TV on Friday that two-thirds of the coverage on CNN, and don't quote me on that because I'm sure I'm wrong, but it seems like two-thirds of the coverage on CNN was this, this, this John Edwards Actually, Edward it was stuff. 56%. No, I'm just making that up. But go ahead. <sighs> You always have some. Um, it's yeah. I mean, what? This is a guy who's no longer running for president, right? He's not the nominee. He's not the vice presidential nominee. He's not. He might be a cabinet member, but why? Why is this important? I see. Why so you're being a realist issue? here. You're having trouble mustering outrage about this, just as realists are yeah. about the Russian attack on Georgia. I, I, I so really could care it's, less it's about. It's just a. Uh, it's not really a moral failing, but it, perhaps a genetic compulsion that Edwards was unable to overcome. Right. Well, you know, one of the better takes I've seen about it has, has mentioned that, um, you know, what, what it did was it really indicated his an irresponsible approach and an amateurish approach to politics on his part. Because, I mean, you never know. I mean, this is, this is um, uh, you know, this is 2008. So, but if he had won the nomination somehow, and I think, you know, you know, Clinton and Obama were such better campaigners that they demonstrated that Edwards was really, really an empty suit anyway. Um, but if he had somehow won the nomination and this had come out, what does that say about his judgment? Um, which is, you know, basically the same thing I said about Clinton back in 1996 when he was having an affair during the presidential campaign, right? What does it say about his judgment that he's willing to risk all of these commitments that he seems to claim to have over something like this? And so to the extent that there's, you know, there's any moralizing to be made, I think that that's almost fair, that, you know, sort of there were a set of rules that he should have known. He violated those rules. He lied about violating the rules. And if he had been the nominee, he would have jeopardized his party's chance at the presidency. Right. One of the things that struck me was the, uh, again, the uh, cowardice of the news media, the mainstream news media, in refusing to cover this story. I thought Clark Hoyt had a dead right, the New York Times public ombudsman, in his column Mm -hmm. this morning where he flayed the New York Times for failing to cover this story. To me, uh, Bill Keller's take mm-hmm. on this was off that the New York Times shouldn't get into the gutter and cover a story like this. In fact, I think it really cuts at a, at a problem with mm-hmm. our, media, our mainstream media, which is getting outflanked by the blogosphere and, and by... And the National Enquirer. by the National Enquirer. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I'm not sure. I, I think on this one, too, I may disagree with. I mean, certainly John Edwards is, a, is more of a celebrity than your typical former senator. But if, if some other random former senator were found to have had an affair and lied about it, it's unclear to me that it would have been a substantial news story. Um, and so, you know, in this, you know, given that, that he is not the nominee, that the... the um, Democratic nomination race is is over, um, you know, despite what some Clinton partisans still hope. Um, that uh, you know, I you know, I guess it's not that big of a deal to me, and I don't understand why there was so much coverage. And so I guess I kind of agree, agree with Keller on this that you know it was not a tremendous amount of news here. Well, I'm sure Bill Keller will be mightily relieved to hear that. Yes, no, and I, hopefully he'll put us in the Times tomorrow when well, we do some of the blogging. You never know. Because I've said such nice things about it. That's, uh, yeah. that's fate. And, yeah, uh, well, Robert, this has been a uh, surprisingly um, uh, agreeable conversation. I was expecting more controversy. Mm-hmm. And 
that we, more indignation would be mustered about mm-hmm. what really is a brutal Russian attack right. on Georgia. But uh, it's been great, and I'm Jacob Heilbrunn from the National Interest. With and I'm Rob Farley from the Patterson School. Talk to you later. All right, bye-bye. Thanks.